Welcome to another episode of the More Than A Game podcast. It's our first one for the year and one I'm very much looking forward to once again because joining me on the podcast today is former NBL sharpshooter, James Harvey. And uh, James is another one of my favorite players growing up. He's had a tremendous career, played 16 professional seasons, mainly in the NBL, but also had a stint in the Israeli Premier League as well. He captained the Australian Boomers. He's won an NBL championship. Not only that, but he's been equally successful off the court as well since retiring, moving into the corporate world and sharing a lot of his knowledge around leadership and organisational culture that he learnt by playing at the highest level as a corporate and keynote speaker as well. So we're going to dive into all of that today. Very much looking forward to it once again. And James Harvey, welcome to the More Than a Game podcast. Thanks, Dan. Great to see you. It would have been nice to catch up in person, but um, virtual it is, as always Absolutely. at the moment. That's it, mate. Looking forward to the chat today, though, and um, going through your career and, yeah, touching on some of the lessons you've learned as well, um, playing at the highest level. But as I start with all of my guests, uh, we dive into, I guess, uh, where it all started for you. And as I said, 16 professional seasons. You had stints with the Perth Wildcats, the West Sydney Razorbacks, uh, the Gold Coast Blaze and the Sydney Kings had a stint in the Israeli Premier League as well. You've done it all, captain your country as well. But I guess where did it all start for James Harvey? Where did that passion, desire for the sport of basketball come from? Look, I mean, I grew up in Perth, you know, Western Australia, uh, on the beaches. Um, was an outdoor kid, loved sport. I uh, had a little bit of an AFL background in my family. My dad and my uncle played, you know, A grade or, or AFL or waffle football in WA. Um, so I always had a footy under my arm, playing cricket with friends, um, but was an only child. And so, you know, the reality is basketball was a game that, you know, I could play on my own. Um, I needed a hoop and a ball, um, you know, some music in the ears and, and away I go. Whereas, you know, playing cricket or footy always relied on that extra person or having dad there on the weekend to play kick to kick. So, you know, I think over time I just, I loved all sport. I played everything, t-ball, athletics, you know, um, but Basketball just stood out and one that I could continually get better at because I was able to play on my own and, and as I said, didn't rely on that. And, and obviously, you know, the Wildcats were such an institutional organisation in, in Perth, you know, so successful, uh, run and stun and have some fun that Cal Bruton led uh, that I yeah. grew up around with those great teams. So, um, you know, it was, it was a nice fit growing up in Perth. Mm. Absolutely. And it's, uh, I guess as uh, for myself growing up, uh, as I said, I was you're one of the players I looked up to and loved watching play because of your shooting style, I guess. And I tended to like all the great shooters, Shane Hill, Brett Ma, yourself, and uh, sort of sort of a common trend that's come through all the posts of all the um, guests I've had on the podcast is uh, they all have a strong and, and high work ethic, and I imagine the same would be true for you um, looking back on your career. But particularly as a shooter, um, for those who are listening in and I guess want to understand more about um, the work ethic involved in getting to that level, uh, particularly to become a shooter like yourself. Um, what's um, it take to become a shooter at that level? Well, first, I mean, firstly, it takes confidence um, and a short memory. <laughs> you yeah. know, you need to be able to firstly forget, you know, how many you may have missed and have the confidence that the next one's going in. And, and you obviously, mm. you know, you train that ability over time, right, with, with work. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, for me, it was around, you know, obviously getting reps. I think reps was really important. You know, um, you know, again, basketball is a game where you just need a ball. You can get out there at night um, and shoot as, as often as you like. Mm -hmm. But really working, I think, game tempo shots. I mean, I still see kids these days working on different different moves or, or getting ready to shoot the ball. And I think one of the things I learned really early is that, you know, if you aren't doing it at game tempo, it, um, you know, it doesn't really count. It doesn't really matter. So... You know, I think trying to train myself very early in my career to be able to get reps up at game tempo and at game pace. Um, and, and, and as you said, you know, just put in the reps, put in the hours. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly enough, I think my, over my career, I sort of changed my, the way I played as I sort of got into the NBL. I, mm -hmm. I originally liked the ball in my hands. I played a little bit more, you know, creative with the ball. But then when I started to see guys like the Brett Mars and the John Rillies, who were incredibly fit uh, and they really didn't miss too many open shots, it kind of I had this epiphany that it was actually kind of easy, right? That if you if mm. you were fitter than the opposition, you could outrun them, you could wear them down, and you don't really miss open shots. Then all you had to do was really just get open. And so my mentality changed and my work ethic changed. I still got the reps, but I, I really started to pride myself on my endurance mm. and my ability to work without the ball and, and get open and just kind of use that mindset. You know, if, if you don't miss many open shots, all you need to do is get open. And to be able to do that, you need to be able to run harder, faster, and longer. 
um, than the opposition. So as I said, I think for the young kids these days, the ability to kind of work without the ball is, is a little bit underestimated. So absolutely get the reps. Um, you certainly need to work hard. You need to train yourself to work on your own at a high intensity, but um, you know, don't underestimate how important it is to be able to outrun your opposition when you're a shooter. Yeah, that's great, mate. And I guess um, early on in your career, were you known for your shooting or was that something that developed as you, you know, became professional and was that something that you feel got you to that level or, um, again, something you were working on it later on? Uh, well, I certainly wasn't known for my defence when I was young. Um, but, <laughs> but it, uh, no, look, I, I, I was a shooter. I mean, I was, I was a fairly yeah. small, smallish kid. Uh, I had a late growth spurt. So I, I did play a lot of point guard at sort of state level. It was a bit of a, you know, a combo guard, but really really a point guard that liked, liked to shoot it a bit. Not that dissimilar to how Hammer and how Shane Hill played. You know, it was, it was a great shooter, but, you know, still sort of ran the point. But then as I got that growth spurt and got a bit bigger and sort of got up to sort of 6'4", six, 6'5", six, a little bit more athletic, um, could run the lane and, and get out on the wing, I sort of changed my game a little bit to not focus so much on handling the ball, certainly bringing the ball up the court and, and making those sort of one-on-one face-up moves, but rather coming off on ball screens on the wings and then obviously working off off screen. So um, I was always a, always a good shooter, but just the nuance on how I sort of, how I shot and where I shot on the court transitioned as I sort of went through a bit of a growth spurt when I was about 16. There we are. So uh, some lessons there for the youngsters in shooting, but um, I guess you mentioned the Perth Wildcats and you came through the juniors in Perth and state teams, that sort of thing, um, reading your profile there. But uh yeah, you, meant, you made the team, Perth Wildcats, offered you a contract. Um, can you share a little bit about that experience and uh, signing your first professional contract, uh, but also um, sharing a little bit about uh, the players that you played with because those teams were loaded back in the day. Ricky Grace, obviously, uh, Tony Ronaldson, Paul Rogers, Brett Wheeler, just to name a few. So I guess what was it like signing your first professional contract? How did that come about? But what did you learn? From those kind of players about um, what it takes to make it and succeed at that level well first i mean firstly you know i was really lucky that my parents gave me an opportunity after high school to say take 12 months you know there is an opportunity here for you to go and train with the wildcats which they'd sort of come to me after the under 20 state championship um, and said you know if, if, if you can make it in these next 12 months or, or we will support you over these next 12 months um, if you don't get there, then back to uni you go. Um, otherwise, you know, hopefully that, you know, the sky's the limit. And so that 12 months where I didn't have to really worry financially about, you know, what I, what I needed to do and could focus purely on basketball and training with the team, I was able to really kind of get some momentum and, and transition to a contract. Um, I won't tell you what the first contract was for, but it wasn't for much. I can promise you that. And, <laughs> and Ned Coton, who was our GM in Perth back then, is, is one of my mentors now. We, we still catch up regularly, had dinner um, pre-Christmas in Melbourne and often laugh about that and about what that initial offer was like and what the contracts, you know, certainly look like these days. Um, You know, but for me, I grew up in Perth. So, you know, it wasn't that long before then that I was sitting in the stands next to my parents as a season ticket holder, watching, you know, Ricky Grace run out, James Crawford run out, Andrew Vlahoff run out, Scott Fisher run out, Anthony Stewart run out. You know, that's your starting five. And then two years later, I'm signing a contract with them. And then four years later, I'm starting and winning, you know, a championship with them. So for me, it was... um, a Perth boy, you know, it was the dream to go there. I'd had opportunities to go um, to the US, but not many people were doing it. And I just wanted to play. I wanted to play for Perth. So, you know, funny story. I, I still, uh, you know, I tell a few people this is that, you know, first day down at training uh, with the Wildcats, and I was a skinny kid back then. I always wore an undershirt. Uh, you know, I was still a bit paranoid about how skinny I was. And uh, we were running up and down the court, just warming up, you know, just doing lines and, um, Ricky Grace kind of beelined over to me and as we we're running the lines and he said to me, what did you win a Nesquik competition to train with the Wildcats for a day? And uh, <laughs> so you get, that, that kind of just put me down the rung in terms of the pecking order early on. But, um, yeah, yeah. but then I've said to a few people, you know, then, you know, seven, eight years later and they named the 30th anniversary team, you know, I'm, I'm one of those 10 members on that team with some of those guys. So, you know, from a kid that looked like he won a Nesquik competition to that, um, that's one of my proudest moments because it meant that those guys that I grew up watching, um, I, you know, I'd, I'd sort of earned their respect. And, yeah, and Andrew Vlahoff to this day is still the greatest leader in sport anyway that I, I played with. Had a really wow. great ability to, um, you know, to command respect both internally and externally to the team. You know, certainly didn't take any shit from anybody. Um, and he, you know, he had this real ability to be a mix of big brother, dad, all those things that you want in, in a leader um, and mm-hmm. was able to make firm 
decisions when they needed to be made. You know, could call you together, you know, listen to people's opinions. But when someone had to step up and make a call, he made it. And I, I just always remember that feeling of his sort of big arms going around a huddle when we were out on the court and uh, just a really unique leader that probably was underestimated in, in how, how, how great that strength was for him. Mm. Yeah, I think you laugh off one of the all-time greats in Australian basketball, that's for sure. But, um, yeah, you just mentioned the championship that you won. Um, I guess early on in your career, you must have thought, how easy is this? Making the team and they've won a championship in the early years, but didn't really make a final a, a final series uh, much after that. So I guess how special is that looking back on it now that you got to win one when many players go through their careers and don't get to win one. Uh, but, again, being part of a team of that calibre and I guess also touching on that... Um, you did get there again against the Kings um, when you guys played and the Kings won it. But uh, how special were those early years, um, watching the Wildcats growing up and then playing in these final series um, with this team? Yeah, well, you're right. I mean, you underestimate how difficult it is, right? I mean, it's hard when you don't have the experience, you know, that you sort of do think it's that easy. And when you're playing on a team like that, and, you know, and I had a point guard in Ricky Grace that made my life very easy, got me the ball when I needed to. You know, I could score a lot of points, but ultimately they'll put him in in great positions. Um, you know, yeah, we did get back there against the Kings. You know, I don't, don't know how, I'm sure you remember that game, but we were, you know, about nine or 10 up with three minutes to go in game one in, in, in Sydney and, and somehow mm-hmm. gave that gave that up. And, uh, you know, then Sydney rolled us at home and, and won their first championship under Gorge. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I often wonder if we'd hung on in game one as we probably should have with three minutes to go, whether game two would have unfolded the way it did because we probably never, we never recovered from, from mm-hmm. you know, losing that lead. Um, you know, but, but look, I think for me, it was around those guys just had habits. Um, they had routines uh, and they behaved in a way that bred success. And I do believe success breeds success. And, and so I was really lucky. I saw that early in my career. Um, mm. You know, so when I was able to sort of transition through even into West Sydney for a bit or into Gold Coast, when I came together with Brendan Joyce and we put a, team, a brand new team together of kind of misfits, you know, all those sort of things that I took for granted in Perth, as I got a bit older, I realised how important they were because not every team did them. You know, people didn't prepare like that. People didn't mm. mentally and physically. Um, you know, people didn't understand their roles and responsibilities as clearly as we did in Perth. You know, you know, I knew that although I might have been the leading scorer in some seasons, really the first three and a bit quarters was my time the fourth quarter was going to be Ricky Grace's time, right? That's when the ball went under Ricky's arm. And we and we knew that. And there was no argument on that, you know? So I knew I had three quarters to get my 20. And then it was, you know, Ricky Grace's time to shine. And, and, and he delivered so many times for us in that, uh, in that position. So we just understood what was required of each other. And not only that, we cared about each other. And, and, and the other thing that I think I really respected looking back on that team is, you know, we would take a physical stand. And, and that not so much me, but certainly, you know, the, the Rogers, the Vlahovs, the Fishers. I mean, when, when things got difficult, they would really step up and make a physical statement. And that, that is something that I think was underestimated until I went to another team. But, you know, when, when things really got tough and you had to knuckle down, um, you know, it's not about taking cheap shots, but it's about really knuckling down and doing the things that are going to help you win, but being incredibly physical and taking a stand that you're not going to get bullied or pushed around on that court. And so I think... You go walking into a venue or walking out onto the court with a starting five, a fourth around me of Ricky Grace, who's arguably the the greatest point guard in the history of the NBL, and then Scott Fisher, Andrew Vlahov, and Paul Rogers, three enormous men Amazing. who weren't afraid to throw their weight around. Um, mm. You know, you felt kind of secure, right? So I think trying to create that mentality in other teams, even though they were different and nuanced in different ways, that's always what I tried to do or hope to do is, you know, have a team that cares about each other, that takes a stand when they need to, but all understand each other's roles and responsibilities clearly um, and then just work together to, to get success. Yeah, that's great, mate. I'm keen to touch on some of those other life lessons you've learned. You, pre- you spoke about success, um, yeah, breathing success there and touch on that a bit more a bit later on. But um, I guess moving and shifting gears to your transition out of Perth Wildcats and I guess... Uh, there's a bit of a theme in your career, which we've touched on as well as that transition from team to team. Everyone goes through transitions, I guess. Um, and we'll touch on that in just a moment. But transitioning out of that team, you go to Israel and play in the Israeli Premier League. Um, not many people would know about the Israeli Premier League. And uh, you had a season there. What was that experience like playing in that competition, but also that country? Look, it was interesting. I mean, you know, most people will know of, or basketball fans will know of Maccabi Tel Aviv and Maccabi Tel Aviv is arguably the most successful team in all of the EuroLeague, right? So, yeah. mm. you know, you, you know that Israel has some great stock there in terms of teams and talent. Um, yeah. 
Look, I mean, I, I probably, one of the things looking back on that, I mean, I, I went very young. I went over there. I was 24. Um, I was coming on the back of, you know, five or six seasons with, with the Wildcats, um, but hadn't mm. spent a lot of time outside of Perth. So yeah. I think I underestimated, you know, going to a new country. I took my girlfriend at the time. Um, we didn't know anyone. Um, but, you know, that was a country that was under pressure, right, and still is. Um, so there was, a, mm. you know, a, a serious war going on there between Palest- the Palestinians and the Israelis. And, you know, until mm. you get there, you don't really feel the pressure or the security concern um, but then you get there and it starts to be a little bit more in your face so you know you're faced with not knowing many people you know uh you know already isolated to an extent because you're a little bit concerned with with safety and security um and you know you're facing foreign language and so i think for me like looking back on that i think if i went probably two or three years later i probably could have stayed longer and spent more time there um but i was ready to come home at the end of that experience um you know i've played some good games i've played some not so good games um but you know i think realistically for me i just you know i wasn't at, a, at at the point in my life where i think i was just ready to go immerse myself in that type of culture um you know and, I, and the, well, the reason i got there i, I my, my agent at the time warren craig who you know was was great for me took me over to uh treviso and i played in the summer league in treviso with all kinds of you know yeah. european players and uh led the scoring in that tournament, like probably the best I've ever shot the ball and, and just scored the ball in my life across any right. level of basketball, just had six or seven games in, in seven days that were just out of this world. And so I was able to get a, a decent contract in a, you know, in a, in a really higher quality league um, that was going to get some exposure and potentially go on to sort of other things. But as I said, I think I just underestimated, you know, the, just everything from leaving Perth and all my friends and family where I was my, my creature comforts um, into an environment that was, you know, it was tense. Or I, mm. or maybe I made it more tense than it needed to be, but it, did, it was top of my... I didn't feel like I went mm. to cinemas or shopping centres as much because there were some concerns. There were suicide bombing attacks at different stages while we were there. Mm. Um, so it was just something in my mind. I just wasn't used to it, right? I grew up on the yeah. beaches in Perth, you know? So <laughs> um, it's uh, yeah. so looking back, I, I probably... I, I wish I could have gone there maybe at 27 or 28 rather than at, um, that at 24. Mm. And your regrets about the... Uh the choice to go over there or? No, I think, I mean, I, I don't regret, I try not to have any regrets. I mean, I think it's all mm. part of my journey and all part of my story. I mean, I think, you know, anything in my life that I've done, which is um, positive or negative, right? You know, even going back to when I was a bit younger and if I've gotten any strife, I, it's, that's part of my journey. So I think, you know, to get me to even where I am today and doing something else in life, I have to, I've had to battle some resilience, I battle some uncertainty and have resilience mm. and, um, yep. You know, walking into a foreign environment where you don't know people, i.e., corporate. <laughs> um, yeah, yep. you know. So I think it all—it's all helped me on my journey to become who I am today. That's great, mate. And I think um, coming back into the NBL would have been uh, a good thing um, to get your career back on track. You spent time West Sydney Razorbacks, um, my old favourite team of the Razorbacks. But then you moved to the Gold Coast Blaze and. Captain uh, the new team, new franchise. Played with Shane Hill in his last um, ever season too, which would have been pretty awesome. But um, just touching on the Gold Coast Blades because um, for me, looking back on that team, like as you said, a bunch of misfits. But for me, there was so much potential in that. Like there was um, a great stadium. They played out of a great stadium. I went to a game there. Loved the experience, um, the holiday vibes, um, obviously on the Gold Coast. But um, why is it that teams don't seem to succeed up there? I mean, there's been a couple of... Um, I guess, uh, incarnations now of different Gold Coast teams and uh, the Gold Coast Blaze being the most recent one of those. But, um, yeah, just reflecting on that experience, is there any reason why you think it hasn't been able to take off up there? Or, um, yeah, what are some of the... Do you think there will be another team in the NBL um, up there or do you reckon um, that's it? Oh, look, I mean, I, I live on the Gold Coast now. So, you know, I, 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 you know, I would love to see the opportunity. But I think if I'm being honest, at this stage... You know, it requires firstly someone with deep pockets um, because, you know, it, it, mm. it, 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 you need longevity in this game. I mean, as an example, you know, like the Parramatta Eels and the NRL have legacy mm. in fans. They get grandparents and parents and kids, you know, so they just get this, this, this whole host of fans that are kind of inherited. The Gold Coast, as they've stopped and started, has been really difficult to get momentum, right? So you're going to need somebody mm. to come in that's in there for the long haul. Mm. And the population, as you mentioned, is transient. It's, it's people here for a holiday. People aren't here to kind of invest a year of their life and commit to a sporting team. There's other things to do. And, um, you know, it's, yeah. it's a fantastic city. I think, it, you know, it doesn't get enough credit because the people just see surfers and, and think, <laughs> of, I think of that and that, but that's, that's certainly not, not the Gold Coast. Um, but look, I mean, I think, you know, to your point around the team that we had here, I mean, firstly, you know, I mean, Brendan Joyce, 
you know, easily the best coach I ever had. Um, you know, a guy that I've got so much affection for. I enjoyed playing for him so much. Um, just like the way he went about things. Um, and, you know, he, he put together a team of, 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 I guess, bits and pieces role players um, or, or saw strengths in all of us and tried to bring that together and put a team together. And so one of the, the first year here when we made the finals, which was our, our very first season, our inaugural season, and I, and I think we may have been the first team in their inaugural season to actually make a finals campaign. It's one of the most enjoyable years, and I know Chop said it as well, that, that we've ever been involved in. It was just a group of guys who were on this journey. You know, we were evolving in the city. We were winning fans over. We were going to schools. We were training. We were learning about each other. Um, you know, we'd all come from different backgrounds. We weren't, none of us were locals. So we were trying to earn our respect here in the community against the Titans and the, and the Suns. Mm-hmm. Um, and we just got on this bit of run. We were sort of, I think maybe two thirds away through the season, we were second or third on the ladder and we kind of fell away towards the end of the year. But, you know, that was such an enjoyable year. And then, you know, obviously then we sort of rolled into the Joey Wright era and, and that's the team that I think looking back on probably underachieved. I mean, we, you know, I mean, between Adam Gibson, myself, um, Mark Worthington, Chris Golding, um, and, you know, so a host of great imports, Anthony Petrie as well, um, you know, but a heap of, of great imports that came in as well. Um, you know, we made a couple of semi-final campaigns and, and, and lost to the eventual champions, the Wildcats, in those campaigns. But, you know, that's a team that I think probably had the ability to win it and just didn't mm. get, you know, whether it was injury or a little bit of luck didn't kind of go our way and, 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 mm. and it didn't happen. Um, but yeah, look, I think, you know, so is the Gold Coast ready for another NBL team? Not sure. Um, mm. I don't know. Uh, I think the model would need to change as I, I don't think, you know, just hoping that some rich family or some rich guy with deep pockets comes in and helps sort of, you know, happy to mm. prop this up until you get some momentum in the community. I think it probably needs to be engaged through both government, council, um, you know, Brisbane 2032 Olympics may give up, may give it some breathing room and some life. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but yeah, it's just it's a, it's a very unique population here. It swells in, in summer, it contracts in winter, um, and the, everyone's quite transient. None of them, not, not not many people are from, born and bred from the Gold Coast, and sport is certainly not the top of um, the top of their mind. But but as as mm-hmm. I said, I, I've, I'm here. I'm raising my kids here, so I love it. Um, mm-hmm. It's just I think it's a unique model to try and get a sporting organisation to be successful here on the Gold Coast. Yeah, absolutely. Other sporting codes have struggled up there as well, but um, we'll, we'll see what happens in uh, the future. But yeah, it was in that time that you um, captained the Boomers as well. We'll move into your national team career now and had some great success. Um, I think it was a Stankovic Cup that you uh, captained the mat, um, if that's how you say it. Um, you're the MVP of that tournament. Um, you had some great success with the Boomers and um, we'll touch on that. But I just want to step back because I read about... Um, early on in your career and the setbacks you had trying to make the national team, particularly the 2001 Goodwill Games. And I do remember that tournament. It was the last one in Brisbane uh, that they ever had. But, um, yeah, I just read the story of how you got cut um, in the lead up to that tournament. And um, it's so fascinating how you thought you made it and then you didn't. Uh, can you share a bit, bit, bit about that experience and I guess what helped you get through that setback and looking back now, what did you learn from that time um, early on in your national team career? Yeah, so that was, um, it was the Phil Smythe era um, when Phil took over that team. And um, mm. we had a, you know, we had a, a training camp where we played some intra-squad games. The squad was split into two, two teams of 10 or eight or something. And, you know, played really well, to, you know, high score, I think, in both games. You know, felt really good about the way I'd played. And and Phil and his assistant coaches at the time uh, made the comment to the group that, um, you know, that uh, they, would only, they would be making the cuts this evening and, the people that got the phone calls would be the ones who'd been cut. So effectively, if you didn't get that phone call, you knew you were in the team. You just wanted to talk to the people and, and explain why. Mm. And I was rooming with Ben Knight, Knighty, who was playing for Cairns at the time, and uh, but he, you know, good Kings man and a great man himself. And uh, yeah. you know, when we, as you can imagine, we're sitting by the phone and, and like mm. you're looking at you're looking at that phone. At what time does the clock strike? 11 p.m. midnight. When that's okay, they're not calling, so we're in. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we got to that point where we, I guess, you know, it was sort of midnight or one in the morning and, um, you know, we were jumping around, high-fiving. I think it was, I think from memory, it was his first team that he'd ever made. And uh, yeah. obviously I thought it was the first team that I'd ever made. And <laughs> I rang my parents because they were in Perth, so they're a few hours behind. So they're starting to, you know, think about things to, to the Goodwill Games. And, yeah. uh, and anyway, look, the next morning we woke up and sort of, I remember getting in the lift and there was just a heap of people in the lift. And for some reason, I remember Mark Nash, being in the lift and I, I thought you know again with all due respect i thought probably nash me some others we we're probably on the fringe of the on the edges i was super young at that time 
and he was pretty happy and I was, was pretty happy and it seemed like everyone was pretty happy. And so uh, we were sitting at breakfast and there was still everybody at breakfast. And anyway, Phil basically came in and said, look, they'd sort of change of plans and um, they were going to uh, actually talk to everyone uh, and they were going to do it that morning. And so, you know, as the story unfolded, I was one of the ones that, um, that unfortunately um, that unfortunately got cut. So I went from, you know, 24 hours or well, 12 hours earlier being on the, the biggest high ever. We'd won the championship, I think, a year or two earlier. Mm. I'd had a good run in Perth. Um, you know, and I, I kind of went through a little bit of a, I probably sulked a bit. I know I certainly gave Phil a spray from memory in that room <laughs> uh, around, around how it was, more how it was handled, not that I got cut, you know, but I thought yeah. I'd made the team. So I, I, mean, yeah. I was devastated. Um, Absolutely. And anyway, look, I, I actually remember, um, you know, and, and you asked me what I learned from that. And I mentioned it to you when we spoke before this, this, this catch mm. up that, um, so I kind of took off and, and took off for a few days, had some mates in, um, in Melbourne and we went out and had a few beers and just sort of switched my phone off. And, uh, I, mm. I think I even was half thinking about, it. I didn't want to go back and play in the NBL cause we were starting to get back into yeah, preseason okay. and mm. I was just kind of, I just was a bit just done that whole experience had had affected me. And I, yeah. I'd mentioned to my dad that that's what was happening and I wasn't, I was questioning everything and um, and I still remember getting a cab, snuck back into Perth, didn't tell anyone I was arriving, got out of the cab on my little townhouse in Scarborough and I got off and true story, people don't think it's a true story, but it's a true story. I got out of the car, walk up to the door and on the front doorstep is a white envelope just with James written on the front. I can tell that it's my dad's handwriting. And I went in, went inside, opened the letter, sat down and read it. And I, I've said it to a few people, it was probably the letter that sort of changed the trajectory of um, my basketball career. And in summary, it basically said, I'll do my best to remember it, but it basically said, look, mm. you know, we love you. We're proud of you. Your mum and I are proud of you. But the reality here is you've really only got two. There's only two paths forward. You know, the first path is to, you know, stay down and prove them right mm. or is to get back up and prove them wrong. And the last words of that letter have really stuck with me on everything from, you know, fathering my kids or, or anything, and, and, he, and he basically said, you know, it's better to just remember, it's better to have people's respect than their sympathy. And I've always taken when I've gone through hardship, you know, and I, we've got some challenges with my, my kids at the moment, and, you know, is that it, it's, it's told, told me a bit about empathy versus sympathy and, and you know, and, and, and also a bit about, you know, wanting people to respect me, not actually feel bad for a situation or, or feel sorry for mm -hmm. me. And, and the way you do that is to, you know, be resilient and stand up and yes, you can mourn or yes, you can, you know, work through things that you need to work through, but ultimately you want people to respect you. And, 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 and when I think of people going through hardship, it's also helped me translate empathy over sympathy, you know, the ability to kind of walk a mile in their shoes, actually under, listen to them and understand what they're going through and kind of mm. go through that with them rather than looking on the outside in at someone and going, oh, poor, poor them and feel sorry for them. So, mm. you know, I use that quote a lot when there's, people that I know that I'm close to and it's not me trying to be a hard ass. It's actually coming from a place of empathy to say like, mm. you know, it's better to have people's respect than their sympathy. And it doesn't mean that you aren't going to be hurting or challenged or it doesn't mean you can't, you know, take a break from what you need. Um, mm. But ultimately, you know, you need to get back up, dust yourself off and, um, you know, and continue to put things in place to work forward and, and earn everyone from your family, your wife, your kids, your, you know, your friends, your colleagues um, respect. So, you know, that little letter, it was a one pager. I did keep it for a very, very long time. Um, but, you know, I, 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 I've remembered it to this day. And, uh, you know, I've I tell my dad, we joke when we have a drink now, you know, that that, that actually, that, that letter sort of changed the trajectory of a lot of my basketball career because I may not have decided um, to sort of continue on with the same passion uh, post that experience. Yeah, well, it's a great story and, um, yeah, great advice. And I think I'm glad you brought that up because as I read um, about that story, um, from what you, you sent me, I think uh, one thing that stood out for me is the importance of having people in your life that have a positive mindset that can encourage you, even when things are you're going through hard times. And I guess I had a similar experience where I was cut from a side um, that I believed I should have made. I went to a different association. I made that team. And I, I remember my mum writing me a similar sort of letter just saying how proud of me she was for sticking at it and just taught me a lot about resilience and determination at that point. But Again, to that story that you said, it again showed me the importance of um, having people in our lives that do encourage us, but also tell us things that we maybe don't want to hear sometimes. And I guess being a professional basketballer, uh, you always have people in your life that want to be your best friend and want to tell you what you want to hear. But to be able to grow as a leader or in any capacity um, in the corporate world, whatever, in your, in your career, you need people around you that are going to tell you stuff that you don't want to hear um, in order so you can grow and get and better. So 
Um, how important has that been in, in your career as a professional, but also a professional basketball, but also now in your corporate career? Have those people in your life that will tell you um, sometimes what you may need to hear, but you don't want to hear it, if that makes sense? Yeah, look, I think, well, I mean, one of the words you touched on then before I kind of get into some mentors and things like that is, is resilience. And mm. I think resilience is a word that's misunderstood grossly. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, people confuse resilience with robustness. And mm. I, think, I think being resilient is actually being able to go with the flow. Being resilient is able to kind of absorb a punch and roll with the punch rather than robust is being very stuck in your processes and your systems or your ways, right? And often when people say resilience, they kind of grit their teeth and they go, I'm tough, you know, I'm resilient. Whereas I, I don't actually think that's what resilience is. It's about different things come at you. And so you're able to utilize tools, people, whatever it might be, skills, um, to actually kind of roll with the punches, not let that keep you down and, and morph, morph and change, you know, a bit like a chameleon almost, right? Um, with the environment that you're in. And so, for me, I think that I've always found people that have kind of helped me be able to do that because I am a little bit OCD. I'm, you know, in terms of I was when I trained and was, you know, a bit over the top with that sort of stuff. So I can get very set in my ways and I'm a bit stubborn and, you know, all that type of stuff. So the ability for people to kind of translate to me that, you know, you know, gritting my teeth and clenching my fists and going, no, this is how it's going to be and I'm going to be resilient. That is not what resilience is. And so I needed people to kind of maybe just look at things a little bit differently, you know, work with me on, okay, take a deep breath or, you know, yep. take the sleep on, sleep on it mentality has never been my strength. You know, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to, I'm going to press send on that email now, or I'm going to pick yeah. up the phone and call that person now. And it's just, hang on a sec, buddy, take a deep breath, take a step back and, um, you know, and sleep on it. So I've mm. tried to find people in my life who are counterpoints to my own personality. Um, and I've got a great mentor at Mervac. He's one of our executives, but I, you know, I, I couldn't speak more highly of him. He's been a, a great friend to me and a great mentor, but him and I are cut from completely different cloths. I mean, he, he has an ability to just to, to, you know, to take a step back, to see the big picture, you know, to not get caught up in the minutiae and the, and the weeds and, and really, and not let uh, get too emotional in things or I get quite emotionally invested. And so having people like that in your life that aren't just going to, you know, confirm or affirm what you already believe, um, mm. but actually have people that are counterpoints to your personality and can kind of, as I say, help you navigate choppy waters by, being truly resilient rather than being you know, stuck in your ways and robust um, mm. has been helpful. So, you know, I mean, I, one of the first things I did when I left um, basketball was, you know, I needed to find a mentor and, and, and certainly have found a couple now and that, and they've been mm. incredible for me. And I, I would, some of the best advice that I could give anybody is that, you know, it's not about just having a mate that you can pick up the phone to us. Like it's actually formalizing a mentor relationship where mm. you meet regularly, you have, inputs and outputs, you have agreed actions, you know, you are invested in each other, not just, it's not a one-way street. Um, because, you know, the ability to speak candidly and have really open com conversations about where you want to get to in your life, where you've been in your life, what you're thinking, what you're worried about, is pretty rare. And you often can't do it with your wife or your husband or your, um, so, you know, having, I, I couldn't, one of the, the best pieces of advice I could give anyone, whether it's sport, corporate, is that, you know, find a mentor, ensure they're a counterpoint to your personality. They provide you with honest, transparent feedback and inherently you trust them you know you feel mm. like you know their intent for you is is um is genuine and i've yeah. been really fortunate to have a couple of those that's awesome mate i think it's uh, so important to have mentors in our lives and people we can lean on um obviously going back to that point of our trip uh, making transitions it's so important at that point as you mentioned but um just touching on something i know you also talk about in your keynote corporate speaking um that you do um, is this elite mindset, uh, elite um, success mindset, sorry. And um, you talk a bit about that, I know. And um, I've been reflecting on that recently, particularly when you see guys like Rafael Nadal. I was watching that US, uh, the Australian Open final the other day and that, I guess, just that ability to stick with it. And um, it's just, it's a rarity to have people with such an incredible mindsets and you see it everywhere. But I know it's something you've talked about, something you've learned in your time playing professionally. Um, is the elite success mindset something that you can obtain and develop and grow into, or do you just have it? And you, do people have it, and that, or some people don't have it? Is it something you can grow into, or something you're just born with? I guess. Look, there's no doubt there's some things that people are born with that they're more comfortable at. But no, I absolutely think all of this is trainable. Um, you know, but it's I think leadership is a muscle that needs to be trained, right? Just because you're a good, yeah. I was a good leader in sport doesn't mean I can just suddenly be a good leader in in, in corporate life. You know, so for me. 
I mean, the elite success mindset or what I talk about is really around sustained success. And that is that anybody can kind of be successful once, right? And, uh, you know, I mean, I was quite lucky my early stages in the boomers, you know, when, when Gorge sort of brought in uh, Ray McLean, who was from leading teams, which was, you know, um, famous for building the Sydney Swans bloods culture with Paul Roos right. and, you know, instilling a lot of that kind of corporate, uh, sorry, that cultural values um, around, you know, what does it take to be kind of, to sustain success. We can bring different pieces of the puzzle in, but we have a set of non-negotiables that we are yeah. going to translate to people. So, you know, for me, that elite success mindset is around that, you know, what are your non-negotiables and then setting your team or your, your success individually up around those. Yeah. Um, you know, and then I think the other one that's really important is how you perform under pressure. And um, Brendan Joyce said something to me on the Gold Coast, which I'd never heard before, and it might be common, but I always attributed it to him. And that is that... Yeah that pressure is a privilege and uh, what I, inter he, he may have a different interpretation, but the way that helped me and, and I interpreted that is that when people are under pressure, you're often worried and concerned or nervous about things going wrong. But by definition, you know, you are in a position where you're also very close to things going right. And so you're actually in a position that is a privilege. A lot of people don't get that. You know, they could even be in your team and they never get that ability to be in that position. So you actually, when you start to frame it in your mind to sort of take pressure as I am actually not under pressure and feeling stress, but actually in a really unique privileged position here, which most people would die to be in, um, it, it reframes and retrains the way you look at that. And so for me, you know, setting up non-negotiables, you know, putting in place things that can be, you know, sustained rather than just fleeting success, and then identifying how we're going to perform in the biggest moments, which inherently are under pressure in corporate life, making a big decision on a project or a capital investment or in um, sport, you know, taking the, drawing up the last play, shooting those free throws, whatever it might be. Ultimately, if you're going to be successful, you need to understand how you're going to perform and improve how you're going to perform under pressure. So, you know, how do you create those moments in training and, and kind of simulate and all those types of things I think is, is incredibly important. So, you know, and that's one of the things that people underestimate with athletes is that, you know, and I'm not saying people in corporate don't make really big decisions, but they don't, they very rarely make them in a split second. Right. So mm -hmm. that's yeah. the challenge under the bright lights in front of 10,000 people, you've got two seconds or you've got five seconds, or you might have a, a minute in a timeout mm -hmm. to kind of get your team over the line with you, believe in you and charge forward under an instruction to deliver mm -hmm. under pressure, you know, corporate level, you've got a paper and a board and a, you know, a, um, you know, a due diligence scope and you work through it and you make a decision and it's planned and, it's, you know, yes, it's under pressure and it can be for a lot of money. But I think that ability to be able to translate quickly under pressure to make a decision that can be successful is um, is really unique in sport. Mm. So, um, so yeah, so for me, it's a combination of sustained success. What are your non-negotiables? How are you going to perform under pressure and how do you retrain your brain to, to, to see that as a privilege? Um, and then, you know, also recognising that, you know, you don't have a lot of time to kind of get people to come on that journey with you. And so you've got to fast track those relationships to be able to, to build trust quickly. Yeah, that's cool. That's awesome, mate. And I think something else that you speak about too that really stood out for me is the, uh, the, the importance of the process, not so much the result, I guess, the process, putting that in place, making sure that's um, working uh, to obtain that result. And something that you mentioned that I'll, I'll quote from uh, your corporate speaking, people are dying to be led. As long as you lay out the blueprint for your employees to follow, um, changing culture is easy. And you talk about your experience with the Sydney Kings and yeah, putting that blueprint in place to achieve success. So could you talk a little bit about that, about that as well? Sure. And, and, you know, I mean, Shane, Shane Hill and I sort of, you know, put that together when we came together at the Kings. But, you know, Shane mm -hmm. went through a boomers program and, and, and sort of saw how you know, saw the impact on, on this and, um, and, and, mm. and what we call them, you know, really is, is sort of the non-negotiables or these cultural trademarks of the team. And what we mean by that mm. really was, you know, what does this team want to be known for? And, and in many cases, you know, people just see these things as, as buzzwords. Mm. Um, but, you know, for us, they were things that, you know, we weren't going to judge players on statistics. We weren't going to judge players on, on you know, how many points they scored or, you know, it was going to be on, did they live and breathe those trademarks? Um, and if we focused on those trademarks sort of every day, um, then, you know, we felt like we gave ourselves a, a better chance of winning. And I think, you know, even in, in corporate life, when you set up those non-negotiables, you know, people are focused on KPIs or people are focused on, you know, getting a bonus or people are, you know, mm -hmm. they're focused on the, the, the next promotion. But if you can get yeah. people to inherently let that go and focus on, 
you know, what do we want to be known for as a team? What do I represent? You know, what, what do people perceive me as? And what are those, you know, those non-negotiables or cultural trademarks that when everybody's in the room with me or with this team, they sing, you know, they live and breathe. And I think a great example of that and Harvard or Stanford have done some great studies on the New England Patriots and people could, you know, you could do some Googling on, on the Patriots, but, you know, their success was fundamentally built on this sort of methodology, right? Where you just, mm. there's a set of non-negotiables as a team, doesn't matter what position you are. Yes, you've got your role and your responsibility and Bill Belichick, you know, talks about sort of, you know, just do your job, but it's about, you know, what do we represent as a unit and we will never compromise on those things ever. Even if the, the referee's whistle goes against us, we can't make a shot or, you know, you can't get a touchdown or can't make a catch. Um, they're the things that we will never, ever compromise on. And so we, we found those, you know, with, and, and with, the, with the Kings and we, we believed in them. And I think they really, we, we went from last on the ladder the year before I got there and then, um, you know, made the finals and just got pipped by, um, in the semis by New Zealand, you know, so, and we were, I think we were last on the line of betting, right? So nobody, yeah. and, and really we just tried to focus on those things. And we also then tried to build a team around people who mm. those things were at the forefront. If, if you weren't going to live up to those expectations, then you wouldn't play or you wouldn't get another contract. And um, mm. so no, it's always, it's really enjoyable when you see teams buy into that stuff. Cause it's, um, you know, it's, it's a bit of kind of, EQ, it's a bit kind of hard to quantify, you know, it's yeah. a bit of kind of, people think it's a bit, a bit sort of soft and, you know, fluffy, but when it's done well, it's just the, the foundation of good teams. Mm. That's awesome, mate. And uh, some great experience to draw on there. Uh, just shifting gears a little bit, because you mentioned, um, you know, your family background, you're a family man, and obviously um, have the, the children there. And you mentioned how one of um, your, your sons is autistic to me. And um, obviously, uh, knowing people that um, work with um, autistic children, but also um, have autistic children of their own, it can be challenging, as you mentioned, and there's some challenges involved with that. But I'm guessing knowing you and getting to know you over the last little while, you wouldn't have it any other way. And uh, just going back to when you talked about the hardship and, and uh, you translated some of the resilience into that, something I've read and learned a lot of is a lot of people say, why me when coming to things like this? But... Um, a different sort of mindset is uh, why not me? You know, why not yeah. me being the, the father of this child? So I guess there could be some people there that um, are listening to the podcast now that are, are fathers or mothers of autistic children. What are some of the, I guess, strategies you put in place um, as a dad? And I guess what are some of the, um, yeah, the, the, the great opportunities you've had um, to, to share and to, to work alongside people that may be in a similar um, situation as yourself? Yeah, I mean, look, firstly, it's been challenging. Um, you know, my, my son is, you know, he has quite severe autism. My daughter is on the spectrum also, but not nowhere near as severe. Um, mm. And, you know, mate, I'd be lying if, you know, I, I, you know, there weren't times where I was like, yeah, this is not what I signed up for. This is not what, when I grew up thinking I'm going to be a dad and I thought of that and what that, you know, that image in my mind looked like, this is not it. Um, but, but to your point, you know, you kind of, you just kind of eventually kind of hit your straps. And I think the first thing that I, you know, my son's five now and I would only say I've hit my straps with him in the past sort of 18 months. And so I think it's important to recognise that, you know, I, as a dad, you know, struggled early on because, you know, in many cases, you know, obviously mums, the mums are a lot closer through, you know, breastfeeding in the early stages, but we had our challenges with our, our kids that we just weren't sure of what they were. Um, and I just wasn't able to kind of really connect with him. We weren't, I wasn't getting a lot of feedback from him. We weren't, didn't feel super close, didn't get a lot of affection, which, you know, kids with autism aren't generally great at. So, mate, for like three years, you know, I was just really a bit lost, you know, like I felt am I heartless or, you know, am I, yeah, so I, I, I think the first thing I'd say is it's okay to like question, you know, especially when you've got kids with special needs, like question, question yourself around, this is not kind of what I was expecting. So therefore this is tough, you know? And so I think only when I kind of actually accepted it's okay to, to have some doubts and some confusion and some challenges and, you know, that, it, that it's sort of been okay, but then I've really just kind of tried to embrace or we've tried to embrace of just giving our kids um, the best opportunity to still be great. And, and that, you know, kids with challenges, particularly kids with autism, right, you know, very unique skill sets. They're very um, process driven. They like routine, all these types of things. And we don't know what they're going to be good at, you know, and they're, and they're going to need to be able to kind of um, adapt and mold themselves to fit into society, particularly my son in trying to get to school. But Yep. I just really want to give him the chance to still be great before we kind of make him com conform, you know, and have to just kind of get through and get by and survive. Mm. You know, I still believe he could be kind of great. So where I've sort of mm. the last 18 months, I'm in that process of trying to find and help him find like, what are the things he loves? Where does he feel most comfortable? 
where is he not obviously where is he not comfortable um you know just trying to read a bit more and learn it's just something that's completely foreign to me i didn't have any friends that were autistic i didn't really know many um families that had autistic kids so it was a bit of a shock to the system and my wife you know she's doing a master's in autism studies now she works for yeah. autism queensland so she's dived you know she's head first dived into the the autism pool and she wants to you know immerse herself and she believes that you know that and something she loves so you know and i I admire her for that. Um, mm. But yeah, you know, so for us, look, it's just we're on a journey and we have good days and bad days, um, you know, but just trying to understand the little guy particularly, you know, and just mm. trying to, to learn some of his triggers and some of his cues at the moment is, is sort of what we're what we're doing. And, and as I said, I just mm. want to I want to give him the opportunity to find something that he loves and is great at rather mm. than, you know, just sort of squeak by in life. And it will be something unique, right? It'll be some kind of a beautiful mind, Russell Crowe type thing that, mm. you know, that, you um, we, I mean, we joke, he's an incredible swimmer, you know, and it could be, you know, he could be a 1500 meter swimmer. You just tell him to get in that pool and stare at that line. He'll be, you know, he, he would train, he'd be religious getting to training, he'd do everything, you know, he'd be organized, he'd be, you know, and I, so it could be a golf caddy and I'm just using sporting things, you know, but something that <laughs> yeah. he, we, we sort of, my wife and I joke a bit around here, it'll be something that he can take really seriously, that he'll be passionate about, you know, he has a nice role to play, it's unique, um, but we just don't know what that, what that is at the moment so we're you know and we're blessed that we get a lot of help from the ndis you know so we get therapy and funding which is i can't speak more highly of how important that is for families that are struggling um you know we're, we're not struggling financially but we're in a great situation where we're getting that assistance um yeah so yeah mate look it's mate it is a journey and it's um you know as i said i think fatherhood for me for the first three or so years was was one of the really great challenges for me because i just never all i'd ever been told was things like you know, you'll never know love, you know, and except the first time you lay eyes on your kids or, you know, like you'll never. And, and so for me, when I just had this disconnect with my son for reasons which I was I, did, I didn't understand to begin mm. with, um, it was it just really made me question everything, right? The question mm. me, like, am I heartless? Why don't, what, what's happening here? Like, why can't, am I a poor dad? Am I, you know, I get frustrated. And um, so, no, I, you know, I, I sympathize with all the dads out there and obviously all the mums, mm. but, you know, all the dads that are, you know, that are, that are challenged by things and it's new and um mm. but yeah so look we're on mate we're on a journey and you know i see some you know some some basketball people you know joe ingles at, in utah is you know mm. he, um his little boy is autistic and he's doing some great work with like creating sensory rooms at their um you know at venues and um you know great. so there, and matt, matt rogers here on the gold coast you know nrl mm. survivor star on tv um you know yeah. he's doing some great work with his mm. foundation so there's some really good people involved doing some great work mm. so i'm sure we'll um you know we'll yeah. We'll, we'll reap the benefits of that over time. Yeah, that's awesome, mate. And I think, uh, as I say, uh, parenthood is one of the most challenging things you do, but uh, the most rewarding at the same time. And I can resonate with that. And sure. yeah, hearing you speak about that's awesome, mate. I guess as a professional basketball in the corporate world, I think one of the biggest achievements is um, being a dad and, and, and one of the most amazing blessings, I reckon, in my life particularly. But uh, Appreciate you talking about that all, the, all about that, mate. And just to finish up, I'd love to touch on um, just a few things from your career as well. Um, just some quick fire questions to you and uh, just around your career. What was the greatest achievement in your time playing professional basketball? Uh, certainly, you know, winning the championship. But I think, um, yeah. as I mentioned before, I got a lot of pride out of making that Wildcats 30th anniversary team uh, because, yeah. as I said, you know, I was a 16-year-old kid sitting in the... In the stands watching those great players and then i now i'm kind of in the rafters so to speak in that team with yeah. those guys um and transitioning from that kid that was you know that guy that was asked by ricky grace did you win some type of competition to train with the wildcats for a day to then you know seven and eight years later um be part of that sort of immortalized 30th anniversary team is um yeah so the championship and that for sure but but it is um as much as i loved playing for the boomers and captain the boomers Perth was so, meant so much to me. That's where I grew up, and that's what I admired and aspired to do. So those those yeah. resonate best. Awesome, best play you've ever played with. Oh, Ricky! Look, Ricky Grace by far. Um, and and Ricky simply easy way to say it is Ricky just made me better. And a lot of players did make me better that I played with for sure, but nobody made me better than than Ricky. Uh, and he was happy to take a young kid on a, under his wing and give him some shine and some spotlight. Um, you know, and 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 so no, without without question, and, and he's just a winner. He just he mm. just knew how to win. Yeah, awesome. Finally, uh, best ever game. Do you remember a best ever game? Yeah, I think. Look, I think. I mean, it actually wasn't my highest scoring game, but a game I do remember uh, was against the Melbourne Tigers in two thousand and one. They had 
you know, Drewy Copes, uh, Phil Handy was playing, you know, Phil's yeah, now yeah, 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 Le- yeah. Le- Le- LeBron's sidekick uh, in the NBA as <laughs> his trainer, um, Brad Key. And uh, we were in Melbourne and, and we were sort of down, down, I think, about 10 points at half time. And so I had a, a probably, I think the highest scoring quarter I've ever had in my career. I had 23 in the third. I had, I think I had six threes, but it was just a, it was probably the first moment in the NBL where I, yeah, it felt like a state league moment. Like when you could get 50 or 60 in the state league, you had those like, those games where you just went unconscious and it was a, a moment where you're kind of just floating. Uh, mm. That third quarter was probably the first time where I felt kind of unconscious in the Even though I'd had some big games, that was kind of fully unconscious and it was against yeah. arguably, you know, arguably the, the best duo, guard duo in the history of um, our game yeah, and right. Copes and, and Drewy. So for some reason that game stands out um, as, as one that I remember. Yeah, that's awesome, mate. I'll have to look it up on uh, YouTube. But, uh Thanks, mate. Appreciate your time today. Some great insights, um, knowledge. Previ- appreciate you passing it on and then sharing a bit about your story, mate. Um, could go all day, but we'll finish it up. So, James Harvey, thanks for joining us on the More Than A Game podcast. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it.